Picking up in the 1870s, near the end of the Bloody Bender's reign of terror in Labette County, Kansas, things in this mystery are about to get messy in more ways than one. The rest of this tale is like an abstract painting. The details, the meaning is in the eye of the beholder. It provokes imagination and just might be a great way to study the human psyche. Or I'm just trying to find meaning in these crazy freaking bloody benders. This is a study of strange. Welcome to the show. Welcome back. I'm Michael May, and today I'm still joined by John M. Keating, who is with me on this strange tale of the Bloody Bender family. <laughs> yes. the, weeks, uh, the weeks fly by. It feels like just five minutes ago. Doesn't it? Doesn't it? I think more like a minute and a half. <laughs> That's what the last week felt like. So thank you, everybody, for your support of the show and listening to the show. And I am always having an amazing time doing this. And the best thing to do to support is just to subscribe, rate, and review, and check out our website, studyofstrange.com for Patreon and episodes and anything else you might be interested in. So I'm gonna, we're going to jump right into it. We're, going, we're continuing the story right away. Where we left off is the Benders, a family, maybe not family, are leaving a trail of bad first impressions around Labette County, Texas. <laughs> that is, that and, might be the best understatement I've ever heard right, in yes. my life. They're just leaving <laughs> bad first impressions. They're, they're bad, bad first impressions yeah. everywhere. And family a lot is of, where you find it. <laughs> yes. And they, a, many, many a traveler are going missing in the area, and some dead bodies have been found that no one is, no one is casting suspicion on the benders quite yet we're in like 1872 ish though i have jumped around in time a little bit and john you actually pointed out a really good thing that i'll clarify here at the beginning john was like i don't know if you actually said how they killed people so very good point the the common <laughs> story of the benders is that they're and please listen to part one so you can catch some of these details if you haven't already but there's a canvas in the cabin that separates the front room, which is where there were some goods that they would sell, a table to eat at where people could stay the night, and the back area with a couple of straw mattresses where the Bender family would live. And the canvas, it was right up against one of the chairs or benches at the table. There and was so, a seat of honor at the yes, head of the table. Seat of, on, would, seat of honor is a great would, way to say it. Name that, yes. Yeah. And the, again, folklore here is that they would, it usually you hear it as Kate would seduce or flirt or make people calm down and she would get them to sit with their head right up against the canvas. And as they're relaxed and unassuming or being fed food and getting comfortable, someone would sneak up behind them on the other side of the canvas with a hammer and whack them, uh, hit them on the head. And then immediately it's, it's said a lot of times as well that Kate, because a lot of them had their throats cut, Kate would then cut their throat. And they might be dumped into the cellar to bleed out and die, or they might just be the trap door. Right there. The trap door. <laughs> they make it sound. Some of the reports make it sound like it was like a mechanical, like it dropped opened and like like uh, Sweeney Todd. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it's. I even saw a movie where there's there is a door right underneath the table, so they would move the table and then just dump the body. It's like no, it was in the back under a mattress, and it's not a right. trap door. It's just a, a you know thing. Yeah, sorry. There, there's an interesting thing about about the putting the head next to the canvas that might uh, lend a lot of credibility to the. This is how they did it. That was a commonly used technique in carnivals, where they would have uh, like the wrestler challenge someone from the audience. Yeah, and they would, you know, they they would have someone that knew how to wrestle, that knew how to hurt people, basically. And, you know, there was always the drunk people, oh, I can take them, blah, blah, blah. And you had to last so many minutes with the person. But if the person was too good and got the better of the wrestler, so they didn't lose money. Yeah. There was always someone behind the curtain oh. with a blackjack, with like a oh. slapjack. And the wrestler would maneuver the other person, the, the person from the crowd towards the curtain. Boom. And he'd whack them with that and knock them out. And then they. 
That is so. There is there is precedent for that. That's interesting. That, yes, yeah. That's really interesting. Oh wow, John. Yeah, that was yeah. an old old like because because that's where like pro wrestling evolved out of was the yep. carnivals like yes. that, and, and because of that, you know. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That yeah. brings. And that's, and I was going to say that actually brings up an interesting theory because we don't know the benders passed before they showed up and no South and there was a Canada. lot of like yeah. german like there was a lot of carnival stuff mm-hmm. in that air er- in that yeah. area of the country yeah that, yeah at those times absolutely Ooh, cool that is yeah. awesome so uh yeah so we will get into that some of some of my own theorizing about the benders deals with that that canvas and that method of of killing people as well so we're going to get to that towards the end of this, which is already, that is, that is cool. That is a really good, (laughs) really good thought. Uh, So where we left off, Dr. William York was searching for his missing friend, George Longcore and Longcore's 18 month old daughter. And then Dr. York went missing and his brother, Alexander, the former state Senator gets another York brother, Edward to come and help search for what happened to their missing brother, Dr. York. Now, Edward York was a bit of a wannabe cowboy. He was brash. This is all my own description of him. This is not anybody else saying this. He's <laughs> brash, cocky. He definitely cared for his brothers and wanted to find out what happened to, to Dr. York. But he definitely seems a bit kind of like trigger happy. Again, just a figure of speech. I don't mean he was shooting people, but he seems a bit trigger happy. And he becomes the, the family's main guy on the ground investigating. And they get a, a group of people formed around the town and townships to help look. And they were actually able to trace Dr. York's movements pretty clearly because Dr. York was looking for his missing friend. So he was talking to everybody. So when, when the group searching for him is now going around to like, have you seen a Dr. William York? People are like, yeah, he was here asking me about this George Longcore fella. So there was a, they, they were able to trace where he went, who he talked to, even a house he stayed at for the night, not the benders. Um, and they heard a story about a guy named James Roach in Lador, Kansas. James Roach was a hotel owner and Roach was worried when he heard that the York brothers were out looking for their missing brother, that they would come to him and suspect him because apparently James Roach was a suspect in a lot of strange disappearance (laughs) cases or thievery or other strange rumors about town. People thought Roach was behind it and had like a, a gang of not vigilantes, a gang of thieves or whoever that like worked for him. So when the York brother showed up in his town, he was like, oh shit, they're coming for me. (laughs) So sure enough, young Ed Ed York shows up at the hotel and threatens Roach. I think he even like pulled a gun on him and is like yelling and threatening him and blaming him for the disappearance and other disappearances and all this kind of stuff. Thankfully, Alexander was there, the former senator, who seemed to be the he was the head on the shoulders of this group. He he calmed things down and he ended up questioning James Roach and determined that Roach had nothing to do with it. And so so that was Roach got very lucky because there is there's always a chance for mob justice in these parts at that time. Oh, 100%. Yeah. And also too if he was which I'm sure he was doing a lot of shady stuff, he doesn't want the heat. He, no, he doesn't want the heat. <laughs> And what, this is this is why I really want to know more about James Roach. If anybody yeah. knows anything about this guy, <laughs> email me a study of strange at gmail.com because it's so interesting because what I'm reading, I'm focused on the benders, so I'm not going down like that rabbit hole. But he he was worried. Everybody suspected him for all sorts of stuff, which I'm like, why? Why, why are people suspecting you for all this? Yeah, he obviously was yeah. doing some shady yeah. stuff. And then he wrote to the governor for help with law enforcement, which is interesting because if he is in shady stuff, but he was like, we need more law. Like, I'm scared. I'm tired of being a suspect and everything. Please send law enforcement to help out in the area. So it's just an interesting little little anecdote there. Or maybe he was just a little weird and everybody yeah. was just like he was an easy go to. Yeah, like, absolutely. For everything, you know? Now, now a, a local guy named Thomas Beers, who, as far as I can tell, did not have any training for being a detective or law enforcement officer, but he became a private detective. And he was one of the main investigators on the case. And another local official I mentioned in part one, Leroy Dick, becomes a part of this group of investigators as well, because he is sort of like a city or county or township official. He carries some some uh, he wasn't like a law enforcement officer, but he carries some authority around town. And. Leroy Dick, I'll mention this real too, real quick too. Leroy Dick 
is actually a very important historical figure when it comes to the Benders, because a lot of the stories we have about them or information come from Leroy Deck. And the decades after the Benders were found out and disappeared, he he was interviewed a lot. I think he may have even written a book or two. And he he definitely embellished his role in things <laughs> as one does, I guess. Um, but he he did play an important role in sort of a lot of the details we know about the Benders being shared down through the generations. Now, as an example of what Leroy Dick brought to the case, he's actually the first person to connect the Benders as persons of interest. Not suspects yet, but persons of interest. This comes up because as the search for Dr. York is happening, Leroy Dick remembers the theft charges, which I, I mentioned in part one with the two mm -hmm. ladies that moved in from Germany and the jewelry box and the cashier's checks went missing. Leroy Dick was told at the time about that, but there was nothing he could do because there was no evidence they took it. So he couldn't put a, you know, a vigilante group together or whatever they called him at the time to go out and, and actually investigate. A posse. A posse. <laughs> and so he remembers this. He shares this information with the Yorks. And Ed York actually knew who Kate Bender was because he had seen her advertisements for her like, I can cure blindness and and dumb wittedness and whatever else she was advertising fits. don't forget and the fits. fits don't forget fits <laughs> and ed actually was like that nah, that all seems like hooey but he remembered the name and was able to piece that together so this group wisely and i'm just going to give alexander the credit but it's an assumption they decide to go visit the benders but they're not going to go being like they don't want the benders to think that they're persons of interest so they decide to go by the benders to stock up on supplies and also they're looking for their brother so they are going to ask about him just because he probably went down the trail but they're not going to give any sort of inkling that they may be thinking of the benders and that is where our next scene comes in john so Excellent. yeah we're we're going to do a dramatization here of what happened between the york boys and their group investigating this and the benders and a lot of this is actually taken from accounts from the York brothers. So some of this language is taken right from them. So that's fun. All right. You ready? Yes. Which, who am I doing? What oh, I that doing? is a good question. <laughs> you don't want to just dive in? Uh, let's see. Who, who's maybe Alexander? Yeah. Maybe, okay. I'll uh, do yeah. Alexander. Yeah. You do Kate and Gephardt. Yeah. I'll do Kate and Gephardt. Okay. Oh, that means I have to do my laugh. All right. <laughs> I have to do the laugh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Here we go. So it's the Bender cabin one day, and Alexander York, his younger brother Ed, Detective Beers, and others ride up to the cabin. They open the front door and walk inside themselves to get out of a light rain. Inside the cabin, they find John Gephardt sitting and reading a Bible. He introduces himself, but doesn't attempt to help the alleged customers. Suddenly, Kate appears from behind the canvas curtain. Can I help you? We beg your pardon. You're Miss Kate Bender, yes? Kate nods. I'm Alexander York. I'm sure you've heard that my dear brother, Dr. William York, went missing around these parts. We're looking for any clues about what may have happened to him. Uh, yes, of course. He stopped here for groceries. I, I wish you would find out if he is alive or dead. He was a very nice man. I cannot imagine the distress. Yes, it has caused distress for not just our family, but everyone who knew him. He left here without worry. Only, only spoke of, to him a few minutes. Uh, isn't that right, John? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's a big mystery. I, I wish you well in your search. I, I got shot at near where they found the dead body in Drum Creek. I could show you if you'd like. Kate gives Gephardt, that was Gephardt if you couldn't tell. Kate gives Gephardt a look <laughs> that says, what the hell are you doing? Then she smiles at Alexander. Yes, I suppose that could be helpful. Gephardt jumps up and leads the men out of the cabin, but Kate stops Alexander and whispers to him, if you come back alone, without your men. I will have an answer about your brother. You're aware of my gifts, yes? Come next week. Alone. Alexander politely smiles and walks outside to his men. Dun, dun, dun. Dun. I wouldn't do it, Alexander. I wouldn't go back. No, alone. no. Anytime someone specifies alone that much. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. So the brothers left with Gephardt. Apparently they were really annoyed with him when they went to go to the area where he they found the dead body by the creek. That, Apparently they were just that seems, the that wrong seems way. logical. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um and the the whole group 
I don't know if the whole group, but they definitely, definitely the York brothers, because they were the ones that actually had the most influence of this group. But they suspected the benders that like that meeting was like, yeah, yeah, something's going on here. That almost confirmed it for them. Yeah. So they decide to come up with a plan. Again, I think Alexander's in charge of this. I think he wisely thinks this through. He decides that they should basically come up with a meeting. And I don't know if he decides it, but I know he's part of the thinking we can't just show up and claim that they killed all these people, or especially Dr. York. So we got to do something to to kind of catch them. So this ruse is created where there's going to be a town meeting about elections, apparently. But they are going to bring up topics of all the missing people, all the thievery, all the missing people in the area. And they're going to put forward a motion to search all the cabins in the area, not just the benders. It's not about them. They're not suspected. But we got to search all the cabins to figure this out. And Alexander helped make this even more formal. He actually put together a petition to the governor for help to catch all these bandits because they're trying to make it sound like it's not a family it's a bunch of bandits out there well you don't want to scare them off no exactly you want to keep them in the in the yeah absolutely so the governor actually signs this thing to give 500 bucks per head of bandit caught and so that makes it more official now legend has it and i believe it because it seems to be mentioned a lot that at least pa and john gephardt were at this town meeting so they're hearing this and they're aware of the searches and the benders actually see the writing on the walls and they decide to get the heck out of Dodge, so to speak. So there's a lot of guessing legend and other nonsense in regards to what happens next with the benders specifically. But we actually know more than I ever realized reading about this story. So on April 4th, 1873, the benders went to a train station in Thayer, a settlement not too far from them, but like farther away from other train stations, the, the best that I can tell anyway. Pa Bender got into an argument with a ticket agent. They, you know, so they're standing out already and leaving their mark and impressions with people. Uh, And they got tickets to Humboldt and then they got two different connections. So some of them are going to go into Texas and others are going to go into Missouri. They left there at 9.03 p.m. that night. Ma and Pa were the ones that were going to continue to Missouri. John Gephardt and Kate would go into Texas. They all had a, a layover or stop. Because I don't think you say layover with trains. Like layover with plane. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they all stop. They all stop for a little while in Chinook, where they were seen actually having breakfast at a hotel near the train station. And Chinook is interesting because it's actually north of Labette, where their cabin was in Labette. But then they're also now Kate and John are now going to go south, so they're going to cut back through. And I was actually trying to figure out like where the train routes were at the time, and I could not. So I don't I don't know if they did that because they had to that didn't connect to go south or if they did that just to hopefully put people off the trail. So like backtrack. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I, I don't know if they thought it through that much or not. It kind of depends on the routes and the trains at the time. And I just could not find enough information. So Kate and Gephardt eventually make their way to Denison, Texas, which is known as an area where a lot of people headed to the West, the American West or into Mexico stop. And it is near the North Texas border, sort of outside of Dallas. So May comes around. That was in April. So almost a month goes by. And a farmhand named Billy Toll, who I mentioned in in part one, the scene I kind of read from the book in part one, talks about Billy Toll. He's a farmhand and he's rounding up cattle that got out during a storm. And his route took him on the path that led to the Bender cabin. And he wasn't planning to stop there. He wasn't planning to talk to him. But he heard an animal, like what sounded like a lame animal making noise. And he noticed that no one was coming out of the cabin to help the animal. So he went over to the the corral there, the little stables they had built on the Bender property, and found a pig that was like dying and hungry. And he fed the pig. And then inside the stables, it was smelled really bad. It was putrid putrid smell. (laughs) And it's hard to say. And full of flies, and there was a dead calf in there. This stands out to Billy Toll as like something sure. something isn't right here. So he heads over to the cabin, knocks on the door, the door opens, and it is void of life except for flies. And it also had a very similar smell to the dead calf from the stable, also coming from the cabin. So Billy Toll hightails it out of there. He doesn't like go searching, he doesn't, you know, go start touching everything. 
he leaves, <laughs> but he tells everybody that the benders are gone and they left and there's dead animals and some smells bad in the cabin. Like there yeah. were some real estate agents on the trail that he like stopped and told and they even went by the cabin themselves and looked in. And so by the time he kind of makes it into town, Leroy Dick, the city official, has already heard that Billy Tolis found out the benders aren't there, apparently, because word spreads fast, even without- Word spreads fast, stuff. faster than you can move. Yeah. yeah. And so Leroy Dick gets information that the benders must have abandoned the, cap- the, the cabin. So Dick gets the York brothers, the group together. They head out the next day to the bender cabin. And you all can listen to part one, my little summation of when they show up to the cabin and they go out in the basement and they smell something. And they're like, we're going to have to move the cabin to search the cellar. And there's probably a dead body under there. So they they have to move the cabin, literally move the whole cabin. And they have to break apart the stone flooring that was put in into like the little cellar. And they think there's a dead body under here. There has to be because there's blood in the soil. There's blood on the stone. And while they're moving the cabin and doing this initial search, Leroy Dick found three hammers of differing sizes all underneath the stove, which is very strange. Someone also found a knife in hidden in a clock, which is also very strange. The following day, there's a, an abandoned wagon that was found, and it turns out that it was the Bender wagon. So people are, are know that, A, the Benders aren't in their cabin. There's a wagon abandoned nearby. They got out of here before we had a chance to actually catch them doing what they likely did to missing people, or at least Dr. York. and. If you know anything about human nature, John, the entertainment at the time, there's no there's no YouTube back then. There's no TikTok. If you hear there's likely been murders at a cabin, you're going to you're going to get rid of whatever you're doing that day and go on down there to check it out. That's a night out. Yeah, that's yeah. Get the kids gather up, (laughs) get the kids. And they do. There's kids. There's photos of the property and there are children because that is human nature. And people start showing up to search luckily they're still searching so i think people show up just to see but then they're like i'll volunteer you need help digging so like people volunteer and they help to to search it out and they decide it is leroy dick that's what i was like leroy dick decided to divide everybody up into three teams so one team is going to go search john gephardt's land down the road sort of narrow strip one team is going to search the ground underneath the stone in the cellar one team is going to excavate the like stable corral area and they're doing that and there's bad smells. Billy Toll apparently threw up when he was digging in like the cellar area because of the <sighs> smell of it. No body, though, is found. No one finds any bodies, just blood and stuff. And I think it's Ed York who may have been the first person to notice that the soil in the orchard, some of it's disturbed, some of it's like loose soil. So they take a rod and they decide they're going to jam it in the ground wherever there's loose soil. And if it hits something, that's where they're going to bo- uh, dig to see if there's sure. a body. So sure enough, they hit something right away when they do this. And they start digging. And about four feet down, the first person they find that day is Dr. William York, his, his dead body. Because well, he was the most recent. He was the most recent. Yeah. And there's a claim. I don't know if it's true that his head was cut entirely off. I don't know if that's true. There definitely was a cut on his throat. And also blunt choice force trauma to the head, which matches the other bodies that have been found prior to this and all the theories about how they killed people. Hey, everyone, I wanted to take a second to let you know about Audible. This is an advertisement. I may make a tiny commission, but I'm only going to promote things I use and I love and Audible fits that requirement. I use it literally every day. Audible is an audiobook and podcast service that lets you enjoy all of your listening entertainment in one place. Audible membership gives all members a chance to discover new shows, new favorites, new formats, like Words Plus, an exclusive music series right now. I primarily use Audible to listen to podcasts, but I do fit in an occasional audiobook, which helps me fit in research for this show into my busy day. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. 30 days free! Get access to the growing selection of originals, podcasts, everything. All you have to do is visit audibletrial.com slash strange. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash strange. Or see our show notes for a link. Thank you. Yep. Now, allegedly, 
the size of the wound matches one of the hammers that they found. Those hammers, you can actually go visit to this day. They're in the Cherryvale Historical Society Museum in Cherryvale, oh, wow. Kansas. They are still there, as well as the knife that they found as well that may have been a knife they used to cut people. Um, so yeah, check that out, everybody. I said that like, I, I actually do suggest checking that out if you're in the area. I said that like, yeah. like how crazy would you be to check that out? I mean that yeah, sincerely. No, no, I would check, check it out. that out. Yeah. If I was in Kansas, I yeah, would be checking that absolutely. out. Absolutely. Uh, but there were more graves, at least five that they could see. They found a man named Henry McKenzie, William McCrotty, Benjamin Brown, and then George Longcore and his 18 month old mm. daughter. They were kind of she was buried at his feet. This suspicion with the daughter is that she was buried alive. Ugh. Now, seven total bodies were uncovered from the orchard. One in the well, a guy named Jimmy Johnny Boyle was found in the well. Sometime he's credited in articles as John Geary. Regardless, they found a poor soul in the well. Uh, a doctor was on site, Dr. Keebles, and he's the one that actually came up with this MO, this modus operandi for the benders, the stuff that has become folklore and legend of the canvas and everything. I actually don't think he, he mentioned the canvas that just come people think of that. He more said someone would sneak up behind the person, hit them, probably hit them multiple times. It's not like sure. one hit. It's hit them multiple times, and they would also sometimes cut the neck as well. So it's a brutal, brutal death. This is not a clean act by any means. Now, this lore has grown with time. People say Kate is behind it. She's the brains. She would cut the neck and Pa would hit him on the head. We don't know that. There is nothing. There's no evidence anywhere that suggests Kate did one thing. Someone else did another. The only evidence is people would go to the cabin and they would die under these methods. We don't know right. where they were sitting. We don't know who did what. Could have been all of them. We don't know. So here's, here's my question while we're on this murder modus operandi process, whatever you want to call it, John. So I mentioned in part one, kind of my theorizing is that the common story of the person's head being against the canvas. I actually don't think that's true. Your, your comment about the, 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 the wrestlers and stuff actually and makes me think, yeah. yeah. And the carnival actually make, gives me more question. It makes me question my own. It was theory. a practice. It was, it was yeah. definitely a practice to knock someone out that way. Yeah. Well, here's my, yeah. here's my issue with it. Cause it actually does make sense. Cause it helps hide you. I know it won't hide sound really, but it definitely, yeah. You can definitely sneak up to somebody like that. But if you're hitting somebody on the head, there's likely going to be blood. And I just don't think you want to stain the canvas that's now been hanging in your cabin for three years when you're trying to convince other people to stop and have lunch or dinner or stay the night. Mm -hmm. I just I don't think that's a move that anybody would do, even a dirt, dirty family like this. Also, it was. What I wondered too, though, was was the intent of the hammer to kill them or to knock them out? I think it's probably to knock them out because everybody's right, also cut. right. Yeah, but don't yeah, you, so no, I, no, so, I, so so that could be a case of where there wasn't blood. Yeah, from the head wound. But I just and you can't control that. But maybe they don't. They didn't care. Maybe they weren't trying to control I, it. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure this canvas, if it was white, was not like you know pristine, perfect, per pristine. Right. Really, yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. That is a good point. It's probably brown and faded. And again, right, and it's I'm, very dimly lit in there. Yeah, and, and one person know. did say it was a red curtain at one point. So maybe they right, which would make more sense. Yeah, that, that would be that. Yeah, and but my other my other thought on it. The reason I question that is. Don't you also, you may cut it open. You may tear it by doing that all these you times. Might, but maybe it wasn't the same canvas oh, yeah. every time. Yeah. All right. Fine. Maybe they had a supply. <laughs> they they, they, they should have gotten into the canvas business. That's what they should have. That, that was the move. That, <laughs> that was, was the move. move. They may have maybe been that was Gephardt. That he had like a canvas. <laughs> yes, biz. indeed. But That's no, why I was giggling all the time. It was all that money. All it's that all, fat canvas all that money. Canvas money. <laughs> Man, he would leave town from time to time to do stuff. That's probably what he was doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He was in the canvas game. Uh, yeah, no, but th those are my issues with that common theory that like they're hitting people through the canvas is I worry about blood. I worry about ripping it. And it's like you don't have to have that to sneak up to somebody. 
Because especially if somebody is getting yeah. relaxed, they're having a cup of coffee, they're out of the rain, they're chilling and chatting with John and Kate, not Ma and Pa, because right. they were apparently just not very social. But it's like you get comfortable and you just walk up behind somebody and smack them on the head. So, you know, and if they're ready and they're prepared and they communicate and they're a team, a good team of serial killers and they're practiced and yes, skilled yeah, at what they're have, doing. They have, a, they have a process. They, they have, have a, a process whole, yeah. down. Um, But here, here's a... John, here's a little tale of human nature <laughs> that is uh, shows how terrible we are. We are oh, we're, we're just ho- we're yeah, we're people awful. Are horrible. Yes, and yes. there are laws to help sort of mitigate mob rule and mob law, and it, it can be a lot. It could be a big problem. And something happened when all these people were were digging up these bodies and searching the land. Is that a neighbor, the nearest neighbor, and another German? immigrant a guy named rudolf brockman was around there as well because everybody from from the area is hanging out at the the old bender place yeah what else is there to do? and so people are like oh my god look what the benders did they're terrible people hey rudolf brockman is kind of nice to the benders and he's also oh, sure. german so he was in on it so that's all they needed to hang brockman in mm-hmm. the rafters of the cabin so they hang brockman and right before he's about to die They cut him down and they tell him he needs to confess, confess to his sins, confess that he helped the benders. He killed all these people. He didn't confess because he didn't have anything to do with it. So they hang him again. And this time he passes out and they actually pronounce him dead, cut him down. Later, though, he actually wakes up. He did not die. So he wakes up. He was only mostly dead. He was mostly dead. (laughs) And he he just gets out of there. And the story is that he kind of got up and stumbled is probably delirious and just walks. And at this point, it's the nighttime and he stumbles on his way back down the trail back to his place. And from what I can tell, no one even helped him. No one helped him up. <laughs> nothing. And it, it, that is just such a horrendous story. Oh, yeah. Um, But that's and part it's of- so like it's so of the time mm-hmm. I, oh, of the time yeah. I could see yeah. it happening now in certain areas. It's just, yeah, that, that, that whole, you're guilty by association, you know, yep. get them, everyone yep. get them. And you yeah. see it. I mean, look, we don't change. We're humans. We don't change. You yeah. still see it today. We just have, we just have certain things in place to help mm-hmm. stop that. But, but those kind of things can and do happen. And the reason this story is important is a, just because it is interesting. It is interesting to, to look at human nature and human behavior, but also people immediately suspected that the benders had accomplices. And when I first sure. read that, I was like, I don't think so. They're killing all these people. I think that's just too risky to have people know. And then I was like, oh, wait, but they have to sell everything they get. Like they have to sell horses, sell carriages, like whatever people are leaving behind. So they, they very well might have had accomplices, but I think in hawking goods. I don't think in accomplices. Like a fence. In, yeah, they needed a yeah. fence. And there are stories that John Gephard would leave. And leave for long periods of time. Like he would be day- gone for days or weeks. He wasn't just running into town for, for supplies. So I think John would take stuff and had people or accomplices or fences, whatever you want to call them, to be able to sell goods in other places. And again, they are not far from the Oklahoma Territory at the time where people could kind of disappear. So it's, it's just a thought because I, I do think it is important to think about that. Maybe this Roach guy had something to do. Yeah, maybe Roach, yeah. <laughs> well, there are there are some people we're going to talk about very shortly here when they were on the lamb that could have been associated with them selling goods. Uh, I, I wrote down this little note. So Bonnie and Clyde, they're famous after they were, were shot in, in the Ford and it came through town and they were towing the car. People would come up and cut hair off Bonnie and cut pieces yeah. of clothing off Clyde and get bloody bullets and glass from the car and just mobs of people taking stuff and and it is so macabre and we think of it as very weird but people did that and the same thing happens with the bender cabin as soon as this stuff happens they start finding bodies people are taking things so there is stuff out there that is from people stealing stuff from the bender cabin even the pictures there are pictures from the search and you'll see like paneling is missing from the cabin. That's not because the cabin had holes in it. People had already <laughs> taken wood paneling off the cabin to keep as as keepsakes. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting indeed. 
And also, oh, you get con men, especially back then, too, because then as soon as oh, people sure. are taking stuff, you get people showing up and it's like, I have a fork. This was a bender's fork. And it's like they just yeah. brought it from home and they're selling it to tourists. <laughs> uh, and along those lines, too, the trains started having more rides into the area because of tourists. So they opened it up for more tourists to come by and see the bender property. Press picks this up. They're starting to share stories and they're not confirming anything they're writing they're taking they're finding other news articles and using that to confirm their news stories sure yeah word spreads legend grows super fast and within months this is a national storyline this is also where you start to get the we talked about it it may have been in part one or in the early part of this part but the description of the benders is never the same right (laughs) right there's a famous yeah sorry go ahead I was going to say, I've seen some that were like, you know, the father was very ugly or the, wo- yep. the ma bender was very ugly yeah. and not, you know, and Kate only thought of herself and mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. Like all, all somehow like the, these, this mysterious family that people barely didn't even know existed. Everybody knew yeah. the intricacies of yeah. their personalities and such. Yes. And, oh, and it's true, because like I said, in the in part one, Pa was known to be a, a hairy dude, had a big beard, yeah. but yet the famous wood engraving of the family, he's cleanly shaven. And Kate, people say she's fat. Other people say she's beautiful and skinny. And other people say she had blonde hair and others say brown hair. And so it's like all these different descriptions. Yeah. And unfortunately, because of the time they lived in, we don't have any confirmed photographs of any of them. We actually don't know what they looked like. We don't. We have no. We have no idea. We can piece together some generalities, but we do not know what they look like. And that's even from people in town that knew them, and we know they knew them, and even they will describe them differently. Yeah. So the persistent thought was that Kate was the brains behind the operation. This starts becoming more of a universality in the story at the time when all the press is writing. They say that she's the one that would seduce people and get them in, and she came up with a plan to hit them on the head and then cut the throat. We don't have any confirmation of any of that. Right. Like, we don't know how they operated. We don't know if she was the brains behind the operation. She was definitely more social and friendly sometimes to people in town. But that doesn't mean that she was the brains behind the operation. But that this is where all those stories start, is all these newspapers just making stuff up just to say it was clickbait of the time. Yes. Uh, everything was based on rumors <clears throat> and yep. yeah, assumptions. Exactly. and. So Alexander York at this time, he, again, he's an ex-senator, very powerful in Kansas. He actually issues warrants or tries to, I think he runs for district attorney so he can issue warrants because again, there's thoughts that there's accomplices. So he wants to arrest people and they do. They actually arrest a lot of people. Luckily, none of those people ever go to trial. There's not enough evidence for anything, but they definitely are like guilty by association and they're just arresting people. Now, on the lamb, if you remember, the benders separated. Mama and Pa went to Missouri. Kate and John Gephardt went south. And we know actually some of the movements at this time. The younger two bought carriages. They bought guns. Kate began wearing men's clothing to hide. They went through Indian territory in present-day Oklahoma. They were also seen using a ferry uh, by a guy named Benjamin Col- Colbert or Colbert. Um, probably, probably related to Stephen Colbert, I would imagine. Yeah, probably. Probably. Yeah. And that was the guy that operated the ferry. And in Denison, Texas, where they eventually settled down for a bit, this is where mom and pa actually circled around and joined them. So they had a plan to meet up in Denison and they, they in fact did. And they decide to make a plan to keep moving. They got to move around. This is still before they had found the abandoned cabin. So the benders have a head start. So they've already separated and met up in this time. And they meet up with a man named Frank McPherson. And Frank is a criminal. And he likely knew the benders from potentially like hawking stolen goods, maybe how he knew them. Right. I we do not know if he knew the benders killed people. We just think he's he's another criminal and they're fugitives, and he's always a fugitive, so they're gonna help each other out. Meanwhile. It's like a TV show. Meanwhile, <laughs> back in Ledette County, yes, uh, back Alex, at the ranch, back at the ranch, Alexander, uh, Detective Beers, Leroy Dick, all these people are are starting to piece together happenings of the Benders after they find the cabin, and it doesn't take long for them. 
to actually find the information about them taking the trains and heading out of town. So they they did good old fashioned detective work on their legs, on their horses, going around talking to people and find the evidence that they they got on these these specific trains. They went on these specific routes. There were witnesses that saw them having breakfast, all that kind of stuff. So they're doing a good job of hunting them down. But again, they're a month behind and a month behind in those days is a very long time. The governor of Kansas starts uh, announcing rewards as much as he can legally do. He starts offering rewards on the vendors. And there's really interesting. You can actually read the announcement, like the proclamations from the governors. Those are still online and they're really interesting, uh, including the descriptions of the vendors. Because, again, no one's calling them by the right <laughs> information. Right, right. Um, like as an example, Mrs. Bender is called 50 years of age, rather heavy set, blue eyes, brown hair, German speaks broken English. But like there are so many different descriptions. It's amazing. So the Benders make it to a place called Red River Station, which is a frontier town. And this is after they were in Denison. And they found out that no one really cared that they were fugitives there. No one asked any questions. It's it's a frontier town. No one no one wants yes. to know. The no, no. Yeah, exactly. No one asked questions there. Yeah. And John Gephardt apparently doesn't even hide that that they're benders. Like he even introduces them as benders in one of the stores in town. And they end up meeting up with a guy named Missouri Bill. And he's Frank McPherson's brother. So he's William McPherson, but he goes by Missouri Bill. And Missouri Bill is very influential in the region. He he even found out through his connections that there were detectives in the area searching for the benders. So Bill decides to help the benders. He goes into town to meet up with the detectives because he's the well-to-do man in town that knows everybody. So they come to him for questions and he kind of plays along. He's like, oh, let me let me see what I can find out for you, Mr. Detectives. I will ask around and see if anybody knows anything, even though he knows exactly where the benders camp are camping out nearby. So he puts them off the scent. Um, this is also around a period of time where they because they're constantly moving so it's actually kind of hard to think about their travels at this time but they're constantly moving they travel up the wichita river and they stay with a cousin of the of the mcphersons named floyd slimp i keep wanting to call him Flo- floyd shrimp but it's floyd <laughs> slimp uh and a man named sam Merrick, who was also kind of an outlaw and moving around he also stayed there at the same time the benders were there so he got to know them and a lot of the details we have about the benders are because of this guy, Sam Merrick. And the search for the benders, this is a period of time. I think it's uh, Sam Merrick runs into the benders, I think, over a period of two, two and a half years. Like it's 1875, the last time he, he sees them. And it was 1873 when they left. So this is taking a lot of time. Investigations, time, add those things together. Money, got to have money. But it's taking so long that it's starting to wear down the resources to investigate the benders. And even Alexander York, who was putting a lot of his own strength and might behind the investigation, tells Beers and Dick and everybody else investigating, it's time to stop. So the investigation dies down a little bit. However, there was a very close call. And detectives really missed out on a thing. And it's a great scene that I could see in a movie. (laughs) <laughs> so in a place right outside of Henrietta, Texas, a detective was in town looking for the benders. And I actually tracked him again, doing a very good job of detectiving back then, tracks him to this area. He's in town. Bill McPherson again gets word that there's a detective in town. So he does the same thing where he's going to go and lie and say he's going to help and doesn't really do anything. John Gephardt is like, I want to see this detective. So <laughs> excuse me. Wait, let me do that better. John Gephardt says, I want to see this detective. (laughs) 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 Got to to keep it authentic to my impression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got to keep it, yeah. So John Gephardt goes into town, meets up with Bill McPherson, and McPherson's like, what the hell are you doing? The detective is, I just talked to him. He's right over there in the general store. And John Gephardt's like, oh, I'm going to go talk to him. (laughs) So John Gephardt goes into the general store and stands right behind the detective. As the detective's like in line buying stuff because Gephardt's like, he's not going to recognize me. I'm alone. He's looking for a group of people. He's sure. not going to know what I look like. So sure enough, Bender was right behind the detective. And I think they even conversed and talked and the detective had no clue, no clue. Yeah. And how did he get the, they could have gotten them right then and there and they didn't. So Sam Merrick 
who again kept running into the benders because they're in the same circles of fugitives. He last time he saw them was at a camp further west in 1875, and Merrick was soon arrested. And I got he was arrested. I want to say in the Midwest. I didn't write down where he was arrested, but it wasn't out west. He was arrested somewhere else. And investigators realize he saw the benders, and he actually starts divulging. Most of the information we have about where they went, how they went, Bill McPherson, Frank McPherson, all this kind of stuff, because it's thought that uh, Merrick knew they were fugitives, but he himself was an outlaw. It's thought that he didn't know they killed everybody. He wasn't aware of it. So the the suspicion there, because all of his stories actually make sense, it's not just an outlaw being like, oh, you caught me, I'll make up stories about other fugitives. All of them really make sense according to other witness testimony, things they learned from the McPhersons. And it might be because he found out they killed all these these people. And he was like, well, wait, you know, the little bit of morals I have is sure, <laughs> you, of course, you don't yeah, do that. That's what that's too far. They've gone yeah, too far. Yeah. And, and they're just robbing everybody. Yeah. That and that, that's an assumption. But but I think it's a good assumption. So we'll see. Yeah. Uh, and that's when the benders disappeared. There are many, many stories that I'm not going to waste everybody's time with of the benders being other places because they're likely all fake everybody's great great grandfather has a story about the benders sure. there's there's people that claim to be the benders that were in nebraska there's a report of a woman dying in california that confessed to being kate bender and the most famous story that i will mention is because it actually ties to a lot of what we think we know about the benders is a woman named Frances mccann she had i think she lived in kansas she had a housekeeper a woman that helped her around the house named sarah elizabeth davis and sarah elizabeth davis was a single mother and one night francis mccann and i'm butchering this tale a little bit just for time's sake but she had a dream that connected in her dream connected the woman at her house sarah davis to kate bender and then she had a conversation with sarah and claims that sarah admitted or proved that she actually was kate bender so Sarah finds out this woman thinks she's Kate Bender. She leaves town. She goes and lives with her mother in Michigan, a Miss Almira Monroe. Almira Monroe is where people think Ma Bender's name is Almira or Elvira, just sometimes swapped. Yeah. This woman, I'll say it up front before I share the story. She's not. She's not Ma Bender. She's she's not. I'll explain why in a second. But it is interesting because a lot of times you read articles or stuff when you're researching this, and like, ah, oh, Ma Bender, Almira. That's what her name was. And it's like, no, yeah. no, no, that's not it. Um, so anyway, this this story is an episode on its own. The Cliff Notes version is uh, Frances McCann gets people that support her theory that these are the benders. They go to Michigan. They arrest Sarah Davis and her mom. And each one begins to blame the other one or say the other one yes. is Ma Bender and, and Kate Bender. So both these women are like, yeah, that's that. No, that's Mob Bender. I'm not Kate, but that's right. Mob Bender. Blah, blah, blah. They're signing affidavits. They're signing they're affidavits. They're, like, they're doing yeah. everything. They also, I think, share a jail cell for a lot of this stuff yeah. too. <laughs> just so, so awkward. And they get shipped down to Kansas and they're put on trial for being the Benders. And it gets even more bonkers because Leroy Dick says that has to be Mob Bender. Other witnesses that knew the benders are like, no, that's definitely not the benders. Other ones are like, oh, that's definitely the benders. Everybody's disagreeing. However, for the most part, most of the witnesses claim that they are not the benders. Even Kate's personal doctor who's, who helped Kate <laughs> with doctor things is like, no, I know Kate. That's not <laughs> That's not Kate. Oh, by the way, this is about 10 years after they, they disappeared. Yeah. It, during the, the trial is just super bizarre. They both claim that they're not the benders. They were like, we never said we were the benders after a period of time. And it's like, wait, but you did. You were each saying yeah. you were the benders. You didn't say you were the benders. Yeah. You said the other one was. And it turns out Almira Monroe was married to a guy named John Flickinger, who had passed away at this point. And people start to assume that John Flickinger was Pa Bender. That's where, again, when you research this, people call Pa Bender John Flickinger. It's not not right. his name. That was Elmira Monroe's husband. Uh, so there, there ended up, there's not enough evidence to convict them as the Benders. They're let go. Also, uh, they were American. Both of them were born in the States. Neither one had a German accent. And both of them spoke English fluently. And we know that Ma barely spoke English. Right. So they were not the Benders. So yeah, it's just a, an interesting story and a nice example of how a lot of craziness 
goes on about who is the benders and what happened to them. Frank McPherson, who helped them on the lamb, the benders, was finally arrested in New Mexico. He could have been staying with the benders as he kept progressing west over the years because he definitely was part of their, their movements. Thomas Beers, one of the detectives, claimed in 1901 to still be watching the benders closely. So he thought they were still out there and he was keeping an eye on them. And then the famous story about the benders <clears throat> is that in 1937, Laura Ingalls Wilder from Little House on the Prairie, she claimed that she stopped at the bender cabin as a kid and that her father, Pa, was part of a posse that hunted them down and claimed that no one would ever find the benders. And this is this still comes up in like chats and stuff where people are like, oh, my God, the little house in the prairie, they they were there with the benders. Uh, it's likely this story is not true at all. It is Laura's <laughs> Laura's sister convinced her apparently to tell this as a story to help kind of publicize things. The the history of when the Ingalls were or when the family, excuse me, when that family was in Kansas does not match up with the benders at all. So it is likely a very, very fake story that just gets played around in folklore. So that is the end of the tale because they just disappear after all that. That kind of wraps it up. Again, my th my only new theory on this, because there's no way to know what happened to them. I think they, yeah. my personal thought is they died. I just think you know, life is tough. They're criminals. Right, right. Someone's going to shoot them. And they were them. already, they weren't, they weren't super young. No, no, especially Ma you know. and Pa, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I think they died. I, I honestly do. I think they, they died. They became out like boogeymen. Yeah, and, and I I think just from the nature of living out there and also they piss people off. They piss people off all the time. So it's right. like you're out, you're hanging out with outlaws. <laughs> you're, you're not hanging out with good people. Like No, I could, no. Yeah. Yeah. I could easily even see one of them because it was a national storyline piecing it together of like, wait, did you really kill at least 11 people? And, you know, they're who knows what they would have said. And then just having someone take Western justice out on them. So I, I do not think they survived. I don't I do not think any of the rumors of Kate Pender being found in California or New York or wherever else. I, I think that's all hooey and just part of legend. But, yeah, what are your thoughts? Do you have any thoughts, John? Um, I, I, there is one, one account that I thought was really interesting where, uh, uh it said, uh, the 12 men, uh, that were arrested and, in, in, uh, all had been involved in disposing of the victim stolen goods with Mitt Cherry, a member of the vigilance committee implicated for forging a letter for one of the victims, yeah, uh, yeah. informing the man's wife that he had arrived safely at yep. his destination yeah. in Illinois. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting because it, it sounds like maybe some of, <clears throat> they didn't get rid of all of the stolen Stuff. Oh yeah, definitely. They I had, don't think they could have. They yeah. probably had a lot of it on the property yeah. as well. Property, I think they took a lot with them because they did when they were on the lamb, they bought carriages and guns and clothes mm -hmm. and all this kind of right. stuff. So they definitely took some with to either trade or sell to be able to finance their their journey out of Kansas. Um if I remember correctly with that story, that happened early on. Not the the arresting the guy, but they found out that he forged the letter. That was like really yeah. early in their in their process of killing multiple people. Uh, which is really terrible. Vigilance committees, by the way, that was the typical way that they did law enforcement at that time, because there wasn't right. a lot of a law. Mob. It was yeah, a mob. It was the mob. And they yeah. would just get people to get but they would do it under the guise of like some sort of official capacity, like city officials sure. like Leroy They were deputized. Beck. They were deputized. Yes. Like you're yeah. deputized yeah. as a vigilance committee. And yes. historically, because I read a lot of accounts, even unrelated to the benders, but just stuff happening in the area at the time, they would just arrest anybody. Like, oh, that guy oh, yeah. looks funny. Let's arrest him. <laughs> well, <laughs> just, as you as you saw from the neighbor. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Johnny the Brock. That they hung twice. Yeah. Um my my big thought on this was I don't think they hit people through the canvas, but I have to say I can yeah. give you a lot of credit because now I'm I'm really second guessing that. I just do worry about like tearing it open and whatever. And well, well, it also depends on what they mean by canvas. Was it a sheet? Was it, was, it a thick canvas? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's typically referred to as a wagon cover, so it would have been thick. It would have been a thick. So that's canvas. thick and yeah. and leather usually. I Ooh. would think, right? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. 
That's a that good could point. Be stretch leather, or it could be yeah. Woven, and, as, but... and as much as people say it's the hammers, like that's one of those historical, yeah. not fallacy because I mean, they very well might have used hammers, but it, maybe they did have a slapjack. Maybe they did have something like that. Yeah, would, to hit exactly. somebody on the head that wouldn't have necessarily gushed blood just to knock them out and then come around the corner and start hitting them on the head to kill them because they try to kill them fast, you know? So it's like, just knock them out and then start whacking them with the hammer. Or or just knock them out and just cut the throat. Yeah, yeah. You know? Um, And it is, and and, and a couple of things I read too were said that not all of the victims were rich. No, no. Some of them didn't have any money at all. Some of them didn't have any money. They were, they either were doing it for the pure thrill of it or- they would mistake it. They would be like, oh, this guy's got to have money. Let's oh, sure. Yeah, 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 that kind of thing. But that's part of the motivation of this is they are, they're not unique serial killers by any means, but they're not, you know, they're not a Jack the Ripper. They're not a Dahmer. They, I think they were primarily doing this for, it was their business model. They were like, hey guys, yes, here's the yeah. business plan. <laughs> we, I agree. We do this. Yeah. Um, but they did it so often over a period of few years because they they know for a, for a fact is it I think it's eleven if I remember correctly eleven victims that they are almost a hundred percent sure they killed yes but it's likely yeah, they don't know quite if if that um well I've said yeah I've seen it actually up to up twenty to twenty people yeah it's yeah. twenty twenty three is what you read a lot but they there's they're not confirmed but I think they're it's not more confirmed than, exactly but I yeah, definitely so think, I think it's more than confirmed. eleven yeah I think it's more than yeah. a, than than 11 because you did have those bodies that they initially found dumped in the creek and the other one half eaten by hogs. Right, right. And it's like, there might be other ones. It's, it's a sparse area at the time. There could be other bodies right. dumped other places they never found. And which also lends credence to, it's probably a lot easier to disappear back then. Oh yes. Oh yes. hundred percent. Especially split up. Yeah. And that's also part of the reason they may have targeted Southern Kansas. As I've said before in these, these episodes, yeah. You can disappear into Indian territory just directly south and right. and where there's even less law and there's less people looking for you. So um, I, I, they strategized. They strategized how they were going to kill people. They strategized where they were going to live. And we don't know anything about where they came from or where they went. And that is part right. of yeah. part of the mystery, the lingering mystery and part of the the kind of thrill of thinking about the bloody benders is we have no idea who they were or where they went. And they may not have right. even been benders. Like that may not have been anybody's <laughs> real name. So right. it is, it's a bizarre, bizarre tale of just pure evil, just pure evil. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and also I will mention this. I have reached out to the gentleman who now owns the property that the bender cabin was on. I have not heard back yet. So if you are listening to this, <laughs> if you're listening to this and you know him, please pass on a message that I would love to talk to him. But I have emailed the guy. I found him. He actually wants people that know what they're doing to come out and like do sonar and, and actually like search the property yeah. because it's been farmland. It's been farmland, I think, ever since after the benders. So no one's done a proper kind of big excavation of the property. Sure. Like just that general area where the orchard was, I think, is all they did back then. So there may be more, there may be more, uh, more bodies to be found that are still there, and, and I think that's a really interesting cause and something. If people do that for a living, if you have that kind of technology and you want to help out and you think it's you know an interesting thing to be part of, uh, you can email me at studyofstrange at gmail dot com and I'll try to put you through or just find him. He's online. I don't have his information in front of me, but he has not hid his information out there. And I do hope if you're listening. Uh, contact me. I'd love to have you uh, on the show and interview you about your plans and interests uh, with the Bender property. So yeah, there it is, John. That's the the story right. of the blood. That is Benders. such a weird story. It is. Yeah. I, and, and like you said, I think the the weirdest part to me is the I can kind of not understand, but I I get like you said is the business model. Yeah. This is what we yeah. do. Yeah. We get we get travelers and we steal their money and this is how we make money. Um. But just like the, no one knows where they came from. The weirdness of the two women coming from Ottawa, yeah, yeah. and the other two guys coming from from Pennsylvania, and then they just disappear. Like yeah, they never really existed. Never really exist, and and yeah. so much legend and conjecture that clouds yes, it. Yeah. Like it's so totally. hard to figure it out now because so much of the stories we have are embellished or made up or whatever. So 
Well, you know, that's is. there there there's human nature as well as yeah. we were talking about earlier. Yeah. It's you know, when there there's gaps. Yep. Our human nature is to fill them. Yep. You know. Always. We, we always make, make up, up we're all stories. storytellers. Even if we think all we're not storytellers. Story. We, we all make up stories yeah. to make everything make sense. Absolutely. Uh well, thank you so much, John, for being on. And and doing two parts of the bloody benders with me. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was a blast. Yeah, I, it's super I, I, fun. And yeah. also, uh, your wife Amber was on my man in the latrine episode, which yes, I think is the yes. weirdest story I that even covered. Wild. It's so strange. So everybody, check out that episode. It's so strange that I started to feel uncomfortable in the episode with Amber because yes. I'm like, this is just this is there's a dude in a septic tank. I didn't know. I was I thought it. Oh. But, yeah, but I mean, just the just the. Um, you know, how did, why was he there? Was he forced in there? Why was his shoe missing? Like, yeah. It's just like, just really, how did the shoe get in the toilet bowl? Like, yeah. just, <laughs> so many, so many. Yeah, I would, uh, I hopefully love, that's intriguing. I know. I was going to say so listeners. I think that's a, yeah, that's a yeah. nice promo for that episode. The man <laughs> under the latrine. It's a few episodes ago. Yeah. Check it out. Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you. Do you want to tell everybody where to find you again? And, uh, Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. You can find me, uh, on, I'm on Twitter at, uh, at Jay Keats, uh, for as long as Twitter is still a thing and, and laughs, <laughs> um, it seems to be on its way out now. Uh, I'm on Instagram under the same thing. It's probably a better way to find me. Uh, well, you can find my website, John M Keating dot, uh, John M Keating And, uh, and I, 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 uh, hope you guys will all check out my movie that I co-wrote and that I'm in called concessionaires must die. It's about the last days of a single screen movie theater. It's on iTunes and Amazon for rent. And I think it's on Tubi and Plex as well. Uh, if, you, if you don't mind watching with ads, I think you watch it for free with ads. So. What is a movie theater? <laughs> I've heard rumors. I have heard rumors. I've heard yes. strange uh, stories about that. I know. Yeah. I know. It's hard to leave the house now. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. <laughs> uh, cool. Well, thank you very much, John, for being on. I really enjoyed yeah, it. Thanks for having me. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye. And that concludes our two parts of The Bloody Benders. These have been two of my favorite episodes to research and record. If you enjoy this type of content, please make sure to subscribe, rate, and review. You can also check out information, show notes, links to our Patreon program, where we'd love to see you on our website, astudyofstrange.com. Email me ideas, questions, links, anything you want to a study of strange at gmail.com. And if you all have been listening to our recent episodes, you know, I'm slowly compiling personal stories of UFOs. If you have seen a UFO, if you know somebody that has, please, I want to hear from you. Reach out a study of strange at gmail.com. Uh, check out John M. Keating's work. Information will be in the show notes, links to his movie concessionaires must die, which is truly excellent. Check that out and visit our sponsors as well. And that'll do it. Thank you, and good night.